Hi, and welcome to Fair Perspectives, the official podcast of the pro-human movement brought to you by the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I'm your host, Angel Eduardo, and my co-host, who you will hear in a minute, is Melissa Chen. Today, we're speaking with Sarah Hader. Sarah is a Pakistani-American writer, public speaker, political activist, and co-founder of the advocacy group Ex-Muslims of North America, which seeks to normalize religious dissent and to help former Muslims leave the religion by linking them to support networks. Sarah has also recently launched her new substack, Hold That Thought, where she discusses politics, religion, culture, and more. Today, we talk about her founding of Ex-Muslims of North America, why she refuses to throat clear about her progressive credentials anymore, the effects of engaging in the activist space on her personal morale, the complexity of social problems and the issues with oversimplification, the similarities between wokeness and religious fanaticism, and how wokeness pervaded the atheist movement, tokenism and its effects, Joe Rogan and censorship, our lack of trust in news media, and whether there is hope for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Hader. Hi, I'm Sarah Hader. Welcome to the Fair Perspectives podcast. Thanks for having me on. We're really excited to have you. And I feel like we've been kind of traveling in the same circles for a long time, but this is actually the first time I'm actually speaking to you directly. Yeah, yeah, it's so exciting. So let's let's kind of dive right into it. Um, you know, we're you you started a, a new Substack, and your writing has been so excellent. Angel, I have been really really huge fans of it. Um, but we want to kind of go back into your role um, with with you founding this organization, the Ex Muslims of North America. Mm -hmm. um, are you still involved with it? What is? Can you tell us more about about what you do there? Yeah. Um, so I was one of the founders of Ex Muslims of North America back in 2013, which feels like forever ago now. Um, and we um, aim to just fight the the many ways that apostates from Islam suffer when they lead the faith. So there's you know community ostracization. I think a lot of people know about that, um, and that happens to a lot of different faiths as well. But with people who leave Islam, it can be kind of extreme. Um, a lot of them face abuse. Um, they face face, um, sometimes, you know, threats, sometimes kidnappings in extreme cases. Um, and so we um, wanted to do what we can to help those people. We wanted to provide them support it, to the extent that we could, um, aid when we when we could as well. Um, so uh, this organization um, existed to fight for the rights and dignities of, of people who leave Islam. And I've been in that position for, um, as executive director um, there for, Many years now, um, I'm still executive director there, um, and the organization is still going strong. Um, and I've learned a lot as I've been involved in the activist space, and that was at least that was part of why I wanted to start writing on Substack. Um, there was a lot of things I wanted to talk about about the progressive activist space, the thing kinds of social dynamics I saw kind of um, overtake the space, and I wanted to you know, uh, do what I can to fix that environment. And if, if that just means shedding light on what's going on and giving a bit of my analysis, then, then so be it. And I hope that that helps. Now you did kind of step away from the public eye a little bit though. I feel like maybe, it, maybe it's just me. I didn't get you as much in my feed, um, yeah. but I got the impression that you kind of took some time away and yeah, you were kind I of did. exasperated by the whole thing. So, uh, yeah. um, yeah, Tell us about I, that. And, and I was off off um, social media mostly, but but also just anything outside of just my day job for much of COVID. Um, and I'm glad that I was because I think it was an especially deranging time, especially the 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 summer of love that that we happened with the mostly peaceful protests and everything. Um, <laughs> I'm you know I I sort of just witnessed it at a distance. Um, and it, and I was able to think a little bit more deeply about the, like what, what we were seeing play out. Um, I've read a lot more. I engaged in my direct work whenever I could. I think that was, um, mentally, um, hygienic <laughs> practice. Um, and I came away from it, um, feeling that, that, the, the path that I had been on for a very long time as this just very um, hopeful, I think kind of naive person who thought, well, um, the left has some problems and we, the real liberals, just need to stand up and we need to talk about it and we need to shed light on it. And then 
Um, you know, and if enough of us are courageous, things will change. Um, and I've started to think now that, you know, maybe something more fundamental is, is going on. Um, and one of my pieces in Substack, I, I did talk about how, you know, I don't bother saying um, that I'm a progressive anymore. Um, I'd have done this from the very beginning, you know, from the very, very beginning, um, because I was uh, working in a context that was perceived as being anti-Muslim and when it really was, uh, you know, criticizing the religion, when it really was uh, fighting for the rights of people who leave the religion, um, because there was this shadow of, you know, perceived, you know, bigotry by myself and my colleagues, we always had to do a lot of throat clearing before we began any kind of conversation about our own rights. So, so I would be, you know, in a position where I'm talking about honor violence. I'm talking about people being threatened um, by their family members, people being abused, people um, fearing for their very lives. But before I could have that conversation, the first thing I had to do was uh, do this, you know, throat clearing, what I call throat clearing, where I had to talk about, well, look, I really am a progressive. And I don't believe in such and such, you know, um, racist, xenophobic policy, um, you know, and I found that it didn't really help. <laughs> yeah. um, and I started to think about, you know, what is actually going on here that we don't trust that you know, fellow progressives to bring up um, problems within the social, you know, culture and, and within our dynamics um, without uh, labeling them as right wing or conservative. Do, do you actually see a direct line between, um, you know, I guess what it, it's kind of mutated over the years. I feel like what started as, you know, being called the the regressive left mutated into social justice, mutated into where we are now with woke. Do you see a direct line between, you know, these kinds of ideas about intersectionality um, and, and, and wokeness in general to to how people view exactly what you're talking about, which is um, these ideas where, you know, if if we were if we were criticizing, say, you know, Christians for being exactly as conservative as as Muslims, somehow the latter is being handled with with kid gloves, and 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 we're overstepping in terms of worrying about Islamophobia and. Um, you know, just kind of not offending people. Do you see a direct line between between these, you know, the ideology and and um, you know, kind of where you are right now with with having to walk on eggshells? Yeah, I think it's 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 part of the same um, broad movement. You know, I see wokeism as as the bigger uh, sh cultural shift um, that that got me into trouble when I was uh, just trying to fight for the rights of you know what I what I thought was a an oppressed minority, and I thought were very logical and reasonable asks. Um, and uh, you know, and I've, I found myself brushing up against something I didn't understand initially, um, and I I think misinterpreted as just confusion. You know, I just thought um, there are a lot of liberals who don't understand that this isn't anti-Muslim bigotry, um, and I need to. I need to talk to them about, you know, what's really going on. I need to share with them the facts about what ex-Muslims go through. And um, when they are faced with the reality of things um, and they see that really I'm fighting for women's rights and I'm fighting for religious freedom and I'm fighting for freedom of speech, all these things that um, liberals and progressives are supposed to care very much about, they will then support me. Right. And, and, and you, you brush up against this once, twice, and then you just keep pushing at it for years. Um, and you find it, you know, I, I'm not the only activist that's kind of in this bizarre little space where they're uh, brushing up against woke orthodoxy and finding it impossible to move forward. Um, and the experience um, over the course of many years really starts to wear you down. <laughs> You know, you have the, the the pep and zeal of a new activist at first, um, yeah. and then over the course of years and years of being told that you're a bigot because you you know are are doing the exact same things that um, other atheists do when it comes to Christianity or you know Judaism, um, and uh, and to find your your reputation just dragged to the mud all the time um, is. Uh, over time, it does 
wear down on you. And it, and I think that I started to think more deeply about uh, whether this was the right tact, even, you know, just to um, approach things in this very peppy, like naive, like, let me just, <laughs> let me just talk to you about what's going on. Well, but one of the one of the problems, right, is that it's it's the issue of of who is marginalized, who is oppressed. You're actually marginalized by the marginalized, uh, according in this in this view. You're a minority of a minority. You, you're the yeah. apostates who are leaving, who are leaving religion, and, and often encounter a lot of issues where, you know, you are facing oppression from from family, from from the culture that um, that you know you are imbued with at birth. So so that's kind of the interesting nuance here that I think you know people who see this very black and white hierarchical, um, just there are just oppressors and then there are victims, don't see the the people oppressed by the oppressed in a way like it's it, yeah. there is a lot more nuance to this and and it's all it's 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 kind of tossed out the window yeah there's a flattening of uh social dynamics and our our, our you know our culture at large which is really i mean as you pointed out um it's untrue right i mean and it it, it erases the experiences of a lot of people um it also just takes away from uh the, the depth of our culture right like Social problems are complicated, which is why it takes so much work and effort and discussion to get anywhere. Um, and uh, woke ideology, I mean, woke ideology, like quotation marks, like who, it, that's the, the term that I use to describe it. Um, it. It does flatten all these distinctions into just um, a very clear story of these are the marginalized these are the oppressors um, to view um, a very complicated reality, um, a very multidimensional reality um, through the lens of this uh, this power dynamic between whites and everyone else. Um, and of course, the consequence of that is that there are a lot of people who don't fit in that, you know, that, that paradigm doesn't make sense given what they're experiencing at all. Um, and then those people are are just erased. We're not talked about. We're not given, you know, uh, platforms. Um, we're kind of, uh, you know, a, an embarrassing um, <laughs> addition to the atheism movement um, because we're uh, bringing up these these points that no one really wants to talk about. Mm. You mentioned you mentioned a couple of things that I would love to dig into. But the first thing I think, you know, you you talked about being kind of. Uh, weary and sort of, you know, beaten down by this this immense pressure, and by the the lack of nuance. Um, but what do you attribute that lack of nuance to? What do you think is motivating that perspective and that approach in people? What why is it so difficult? Um, well, I, I think, I mean, it's it, so I try not to look at everything through the realm realm of uh, or um, through. through through religion, but I, maybe I can't mm. help it. Maybe that's just my background. And it's one of those, you know, um, <laughs> I was leading you have to a that. hammer kind of thing. Um, yeah. but, but I, I, I do see, um, a lot of similarities between, um, the, the ideology that has taken over much of the elite and, um, just religion in general and religious fanaticism and fundamentalism. And I have a lot of experience with, um, you know, countries and communities that get taken over by by something very something that just a couple of years ago would have seemed insane. Um, and I've seen how quickly these things become normalized. Um, and a lot of it just has to do with the way that we socialize um, with um, our 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 very interesting ability to to shut down our own mental and reasoning capacities um, when there is significant social pressure um, to behave one way or another. Um, and I've seen communities fall to to fundamentalism fairly easily, you know, and overnight, it seems like. And in a way where, uh, you know, no one really understands that what the one change was that flipped the switch between, you know, insane fundamentalism and 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 your, your normal day to day life, but it's, it just, it just slides into it fairly quickly. And then once you're there, um, it, it, there is not a lot of oxygen for, for anyone who disagrees. And I think that's right. where we are with, you know, the current progressive, like liberal space. I mean, it, I even hesitate to use the terms progressive and liberal because 
they don't seem liberal to me. They don't seem progressive to me. So it just feels right. like a betrayal even of those movements to, to say that, that, that this is what we're seeing. We're seeing progressives lose their mind. I don't know if they're progressive anymore. I don't know if they're liberal anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's analogous actually to the kind of, you know, speaking of kind of betraying the principles, there was the whole new atheist movement, which is part of, you know, when you came up, um, that kind of, a lot of it kind of, you mentioned this kind of phased into this same sort of dogmatism. And it seems that if anyone would be inoculated to this, it would be the people who just escaped a similar sort of dogmatism. Mm -hmm. Many, you know, many of the, that new, new atheist movement were apostates. Um, but here we are, and now there's kind of this new dogma that just got adopted. What do you think is going on there? And, and yeah, how did um, we not see it? Yeah, I think, so it wasn't so much new atheists that became very woke, but it is the atheist community in general that became right, very yeah. woke and sort of slid into it very quickly. Um, you know, I mean, the switch happened overnight and I saw it. Um, so I have a confession that I'll share here that I don't think I've talked about anywhere else. Um, in the very beginning stages, like when I first came, became a part of the atheist community, um, I was a bit of an SUW. I mean, not, not quite, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was, I was on the side of, of, you know, there was, there was a kind of a divide that was happening between feminists and, um, uh, and skeptics, I guess you might call them, um, in the atheism community at that time, they called oh, it elevator this. gate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I remember um, this. So that was happening. And right in the initial stages, I was with the feminists. I mean, I understood, um, the points that they were making intuitively, like as a woman, I've had certain experiences and, sure. um, I couldn't see anything wrong with making atheism a more inclusive space for, for women and minorities. And then, and then as I witnessed, well, how are they going to bring this about? I started to see that there's no way this will work, you know, or if it does work, <laughs> it will destroy a lot of important um, values that, that, that atheists tend to hold and have, right? Like due process, right? Um, like true critical debate, open discussion, you know, the, we're going to lose all of that. And it is really important that we don't risk these very important values. Um, uh, so, so then I, I started to see in my own mind, I started to think about, um, what exactly is going on here. But at first I was just, um, a little bit distant. I was just working on my little nonprofit chugging away. Um, <laughs> and then as I started to become more active and become more open and engage in these public debates, uh, people started to get a little bit more frustrated with how I was engaging and the points that I was bringing up. I remember, um, this was back in like 2015, I gave a speech and that speech did fairly well. And I think that was when a lot of people started hearing of me from, at the American Humanist Association. I was so terrified. It was my first like big speech like that. I was, um, extremely nervous. I think I had like two shots, like before I went up on, on, <laughs> on the podium, cause just to calm my nerves. Um, but right before, um, you know, uh, my speech, which was about the necessity of liberals to start critiquing Islam, there was a panel and that panel was about anti-racism and their, uh, you know, their approach to, what we need to do more of and what we need to do less of was I mean, their, their prescriptions were the exact opposite of mine. Um, they mm. were saying, you know, stop and listen, like, you know, uh, uh, don't talk about these things or let's, let's, let's think about what we mean when we say free, free expression, you know, um, mm. which was, a, it was just a completely opposite um, perspective than the one that I had and the one that I was bringing to the table. Um, so I was very, you know, even in that time, I was very nervous because I was seeing this uh, movement take over um, organized atheism. Um, and I, you know, a lot of people have brought up that, that maybe it is the case that uh, something about losing your spiritual center or, a, you know, community grounding makes you more susceptible to being swept up by a different kind of ideology, especially something like this, that's very like takes over your brain. Right. And, and, mm. um, 
and has very strict demands on people. Uh, I mean, there's, I think there is something to be said there. You know, I do think people crave uh, a kind of rigidity um, and, and, and a space where they can just, just stop and, and do the thing that people want them to do and they can belong to this community um, and feel as if they are a part of something bigger. Well, you can see that in the movement itself because, Mm -hmm. you know, there were militant atheists, people, that's what they were all about. You know, their podcasts Mm -hmm. were all about it. If Mm -hmm. they were in a band, their band was all about it and it was terrible. Um, (laughs) it, it turned into this thing, but, but what's, what's unique about it to me, what's interesting is that there's, I think there's a pretty important difference between forming a community or forming a sense of identity around what you're against versus something that you're for. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that might be one part of the allure there where, you know, anti-racism, yes, it's anti-racism, but it's for a bunch of stuff. It's very kind of proactive in that way. Mm-hmm. Whereas the atheist community was more about, no, this is all bad. It needs to go away kind of stuff. And there's not, yeah, you know, I mean, there's but, a but huge even variety. humanists didn't really survive yeah. it. And if anything, the humanists were the first to go. Right. Um, and the true. humanists <laughs> tend to have a very... And I, I, you know, what you said makes perfect sense to me. And I would think that that, that that is really what's going on, except, um, the the first people to sort of just be really deranged, uh, by, by social justice activism were, were the humanists. And I think these were the, maybe what's going on is, is, is not that effect, but just that, um, these are the people who had a very strong, um, you know, self-orientation towards being caring individuals and compassionate individuals, right? And so right. Then, then we have a movement that says, if you are caring, if you are compassionate, you will listen to our pain because we are in pain right. and we are, you know, literally shaking all the time. And, 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 and they talk about all the harms against uh, marginalized people, against women, against, um, uh, you know, minorities. And so if you're somebody who very much cares about being caring, right? Uh, or even being seen to be caring, right? I mean, if that's something, right. that's how you see yourself, you will be vulnerable to this kind of tactic, even if it's not based on anything real. You know, even if mm-hmm. it's, even if there's nothing to it, it's easy to be shamed into a corner. Um, and I think that is partially what what I saw happen to 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 the humanists in particular. I, I think it's also, you know, if it's limited focus, right? So, you know, your organization, you are actually defining yourself by something that I won't say you're against, but you're, you're defining it's, it's interesting. You're, you're, it's ex Muslims of North America. You you are, it's a group of people who are not something anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's limited focus. So, you know, there are certain issues that pertain to this community and trying to leave this community, um, and, and all the attendant kind of cultural, you know, issues, um, that, that go along with that. And so you're addressing that in a very limited way. But I'm sure if you survey your members, people who do identify themselves as ex-Muslims who live here in this country or, or um, Canada, um, politically and everything, they're, they're probably all over the map. You probably have, you know, um, progressive Muslims as, as well as conservative Muslims um, politically, right? Like who would vote for uh, Trudeau or who would vote for Harper or something like that. So I, I do think it... Um, the limited focus aspect of being against something um, is is interesting, but then group dynamics always kind of end up infecting it. Mm-hmm. I know we're talking about the new atheist movement, but but that's also true of you know say the intellectual dark web and what happened to it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so group dynamics always kind of set in after a while if you don't define if you're if you're not uh, positively for something. I think that's that's a that's a better um, way to organize yourself in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that distinction that you made between, um, you know, between having a limited focus, but also like having an action oriented focus, right? Like we want this, Mm. like, this is what we want. Um, and we're, we're, we're oriented towards getting to that goal and not towards necessarily having a shared, like whole philosophy. Um, and I think that, 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 helps us in at least in the short term so far i think it's been good for the organization that we've just been um focused on 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 actually the very difficult problems that 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 we're thinking about um but but there's there's a separate problem of of people's i people's need to belong to something um people's mm-hmm. need to have their identities anchored in something outside themselves almost yeah. that is 
that is currently not being met by by a lot of things. And it used to be met by religion. Um, it used to be met by maybe your 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 community that you were you were born into, even if that's a cultural community. But now that we're in this this new world, there's a lot of choice, which is fantastic. I'm so happy. And, you know, we, we can be who we want to be. We can recreate ourselves. Um, however we like. I think that there is the side effect of that as well, which is of feeling alienated and feeling yep. disconnected and uh, sort of floating in, in space somewhere without um, something to give you, um, you know, uh, something to give you perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think people will increasingly gravitate towards these ideologies, whether that be a woke ideology or far right extremism, but anything that can give them a clear sense of their past, of their present, of their future, right? Like, and people Mm. crave this, right? They crave, this is, this is how to look at American history. They don't want, um, things are complicated. (laughs) Like America's (laughs) good, but America's also done some bad things. And, 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 you know, this, it's very difficult to come out of that nuanced perspective still being able to hold on to principles, right? Um, uh, still being able to think that, well, we did some bad things, but America is still a country worth fighting for. We're still a nation that's grounded in some principles that are worth fighting for. Um, mm. The average American is still a good person, a good neighbor, right? Um, it, it's actually a, a difficult position to hold. And I think we should if we're to move forward and to, to, to get past this hurdle, we have to acknowledge that it's not as easy as it sounds to, right. to hold this. It's much easier to say, let me condemn America and all Americans and our, you know, we were founded on, you know, such and such principles of, of uh, inequality rather than equality. Um, so I think that, that we have to acknowledge uh, the, the internal difficulties, the, uh, the the challenges to one's sense of self and one's um, uh, uh, connection with others that modernity is bringing yeah. um, so that we can better prepare for these ideologies that will um, take advantage of, of the, the alienation that people are experiencing and give them an answer. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, a lot of things. One of the things that came up when I was listening to you just now is that Martin Luther King quote, which I think he wrote when he was like a teenager, but just about the the purpose of education that, you know, intelligence is not the only aim. Intelligence plus character, that is the mark of true education. And I think what he's getting at there is that, uh, you know, there's another quote of his where, you know, we, we've, uh, we have our, our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. You know, we have, we have guided missiles and misguided men. And I think the the principles at play are, are similar there, which is just that the more we the more we get, the more options we have, the wider our world gets, the more complex our world gets, the more responsibility we have mm-hmm. to it and for it mm-hmm. in order to to navigate it properly. But what we what we just instinctively do is flatten everything because right. it's just easier, right? Like I, I keep thinking of you know the anxiety that I get when I see those stupid little badges on my phone. You know, you have 46 text messages, you have 200, like I get people, people troll me now. They send me screen grabs of their phone, um, with like 10,000 unread emails because it gives me anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) but like what I, all I want to do is get rid of that little red bubble. All I want to do is get rid of those numbers. I want it to be clean and clear. And I feel like that's just a human thing. And Mm -hmm. I think we're just doing that with everything. Like, oh my God, there's way too much nuance and complexity. Let me just flatten it answer all the questions, you know, like select all, click yes, and then we're done. Yeah. Um, yeah. But of course, there's so many unintended consequences to that. And I think mm-hmm. one of them you wrote about, which is it manifested itself in the, in, in the atheist community with tokenism. You mm-hmm. wrote this great piece about tokenism and the way that it, it actually ends up erasing people, all the exact same people you're trying to uplift and highlight and, you know, make sure they're included. You're, you're erasing them all. Mm-hmm. Um, so talk a little bit about that, what your experience was and what you think. Yeah, um, it's it's a tough subject to talk about because you never want to see yourself as a token. You know, right. you always want to it, entertain the idea that I belonged where I was and I was included because I'm talented and I'm 
intelligent and, you know, nice to people, whatever. But you you want to be, uh, you want to earn your spot. And it's painful to, to look back um, at your work that you, you know, that it, it's something that you care about. Um, uh, something that you gave your whole heart and soul in, into and to see that maybe people weren't looking at me um, in, the, in quite that way. Uh, maybe they saw me as something a lot more superficial than that. Um, something to, to uh, you know, uh, protect them from charges of racism um, that I'm this like melanated, you know, um, uh, shield. <laughs> and uh, it's a, it was a tough thing to write about and to talk about. I covered um, one experience that I had, and I, I'll let people read the piece itself. I won't go into detail about it, but one mm-hmm. experience that I had, uh, and there were many. So there were many to pick from, but I just didn't want to out too many people. Um, I didn't want to get. <laughs> I didn't want to start any drama because it's just not. It's not because I'm afraid of it, but because it's uh, annoying. So. <laughs> I, I, I picked an example that was um, a long time ago, and uh, I thought fairly well illustrated my point, which was when we were putting on this very large event, um, very, very expensive, very, very large event um, for the atheist community. And um, very quickly, the dynamic became, um, I mean, and uh, I'm, I, even when I'm describing this to you, of course, there were other things going on. There were other challenges that organization organizers were facing. This is just one aspect of it. And the, and, and I, I think a particularly harmful aspect, which was that we were uh, pressured very strongly to have tokens on, you know, the speaker panels um, on, you know, uh, on the, the, um, even the organizers, right? Like, so even my position where I was, I was a board member, I was an organizer, I was helping run things. There was a, there was a powerful pressure that was just running behind the scenes to get anyone that looked colored, you know, like, uh, like me, like anyone who looks like they were an ethnic person um, involved and only for one reason, which was just to, to uh, make it so that there wasn't um, too many accusations of racism and sexism um, inevitably. And I think that this created a climate where, you know, I, I, I'll, I won't repeat um, what I talked about in my piece, um, but I'll share some more, I guess, personal experiences, which is that I felt as if um, you know, knowing that my space, my seat on, uh, on this board was kind of tokenistic that when I was seeing problems, you know, when I was seeing mistakes, you know, occurring, I didn't feel empowered enough to speak up because I knew, you know, in the back of my head, they're not really, they don't really care about what I think. (laughs) That's not why I'm here. Um, And so I, I wasn't as loud about the problems that I saw as I, as I would have been, had I been sure that my, my seat was deserved. and I, it created a sense of distance, I felt, um, between myself and the other organizers, um, you know, that there was this camaraderie, camaraderie of people who are working together for, uh, to, to achieve a goal. Um, they're based on their own individual talents and, you know, unique perspectives. Um, and I was kind of this, like, outsider, you know, I was one of the few, like, tokenized people. Um, I think it, over time, it just destroys communities. And what it does is it leads to more tokenism. And that's sort of inevitable that, that once you begin to tokenize and you begin to pull in people, um, these superficial, um, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, people superficially maybe qualified, um, but not it, it, their main, um, uh, qualification being that they are, Latino or black or, mm-hmm. or South Asian, um, over time, it, it creates these really warped incentives that make it that make it so that, um, talented minorities, true talented minorities will not either, they either will not stay in that community very long or their talents will not be fostered and they will not become as competent as they could. Um, and then over time, you're just going to see more and more superficial diversity, um, aka tokenism. And I think well, I was just going to say, there. yeah, I was actually just going to say that what you, what you just described seems to me to be kind of we're down that path with DEI, the diversity, equity and inclusion um, movement, because it's it's now 
you know, what you're describing is now happening on the board level, on school admissions levels, and you know, might take over all of all of society as a as a you know as an approach. So, I mean, the problems of tokenism, I, I don't, I don't really see that being um, slowed down in any way. I mean, I can't, mm-hmm. other than returning to, to, you know, kind of the the, the baseline, really like equal opportunity. I, I can't see this actually being reversed. Yeah, I, I, I don't either. I don't. I think there's only this is a you know one way train, um, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm going to be thinking about, of course, how we can possibly reverse it. But it just doesn't seem like something that can you know even if we were to implement some changes, maybe um, on a legal level um, or try try and change a culture slowly but surely, it will take many many years. Um, mm-hmm. But I, in the meantime. We are, I think, Melissa, you're you're perfectly right that this is just something we're about to see more and more and more of. Um, and there's a tax there, you know what I mean? If you forget about it from a we can we can talk about um on a pure, you know, market-oriented level, there's just if if you force companies and organizations to think about something other than uh, efficiency and productivity and competence, um, you're necessarily going to, you're, you're, you're forcing a tax on them. Yeah. Um, that they have to swallow or or another. Um, so they're going to think of easy and quick ways to do it. And those easy and quick ways will be to create these, uh, sinecures for tokenized people. Um, they're Mm -hmm. not going to have much power or say necessarily, but it's just going to be this like safe space that we can throw you in and then you won't be able to do much damage. And we'll be able to say that we have such and such percentage Brown and black people, um, you know, um, involved. And, um, you know, so that's, that's a tax that on a societal level will, will harm, you know, our ability, you know, in the Western world to compete with, Yep. Um, other civilizations, w- which are doing nothing other than they're just optimizing, right? They're optimizing for productivity. They're optimizing for efficiency. They're optimizing exactly. for, for, for dominance. And here we are um, c- putting a tax on, on, our, right. um, on our institutions that just seems to me to be stupid uh, beyond, right. you know, a lot of other things. It's just, it's definitely one of those things that's going to be... Uh, it, it's self-harming and it will we will and there's feel. a spiritual tax as well i think you know like like the resentment that it does create um between groups of mm-hmm. so- of people here in this country who have to share this country and have to share certain values to live in this country mm-hmm. and and there is that spiritual harm i mean i know we're atheists talking about spirituality but but there there is a, a cost to mm-hmm. on, on a on a cultural level i think we don't want to use the word spiritual <laughs> no I, yeah. I i i've started to use the word spiritual uh, more to melissa because I think it captures something that is difficult to articulate in any other way, even though I don't mean it in the sense of being connected to a divine, divine. but I, but I yeah. do mean it as being connected to, you know, community or to some values Same. Um, in a way that transcends uh, just a pure rational calculation. Um, right. uh, and uh, yeah, you're right that it, that it, um, I mean, would you say that in the past 10 years, you feel like, we have got become a more tolerant and ex- like, have we become a, 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 a society that is better about race? You know, I, have you felt, um, there was a, there was a time where I would say that the goal is post-racialism, right? It's a, it's a, it's a time yeah. where we just don't see race anymore and it really doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I think it matters a lot more now than it did 10 years ago. You know, I, a, a lot more now. And I notice it a lot more now. I think about it a lot more now. In my day to day interactions, race is an issue in a way that it wasn't 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So where are we headed? Right. Like we're 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 little we're we're going towards a society that becomes more segmented, that becomes where racial identities become more and more crystallized. And we begin to mm-hmm. address each other as collectives um you know as representatives of certain yeah. races um and uh, how can this possibly be a good thing yeah you, know, you yeah. know um and i see there's there's uh there's a hesitancy or even denial in some quarters about the fact that this is happening um and i keep being right. I'm, I'm 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 told all the time we need to talk about race we need to talk about this problem and that problem it feels to me that we're doing nothing but talking about this yeah. all the time um and it hasn't helped <laughs> you know i wonder and what you works. think 
What What do you think, though, about the possibility that the the discourse around race has definitely been exacerbated and and has blown up beyond you know what we could have even imagined ten years ago, but that the reality is probably better or at least the same as it used to be, where you know it's possible to put your phone down, delete your Twitter, not watch the news like you 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 know you wrote that piece just now uh, about not watching the news, <laughs> walk away and just interact with your neighbors Mm -hmm. and just do go, you know, go about your daily life and actually not have it be a thing. Is that Mm -hmm. actually, is that real? Or is that just a perception that I have? Because maybe I have, you know, a a particular cohort of people who really don't care about this stuff um, in that way. I mean, you know, the things that matter, matter, but what do you think about that? Do you think that it's, it's kind of a, it's a tough thing to gauge, especially when, you know, we, I think, I think I'll speak for all three of us. And I say that we are in a very special little bubble <laughs> where we're hyper-focused right. on culture and uh, cultural changes. And we're, sp- we're hyper-focused also on elite behavior versus the behavior of the, of the everyday man. And I, I, I we're, we're certainly distanced from the everyday American, even if I, I think we make efforts not to be, I make efforts to participate and, you know, in, in the part of the world that doesn't know that Twitter is a thing still. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, it, you're right that it does feel different. Um, and I think to, to a large extent that, that it is, um, it's not as bad as, as elites and they kind of are operating on like the every the normal Americans are, are operating under different rules. Um, yeah. And I think there is a, to the extent that we have more interracial marriages and relationships, um, that is actually a very good sign of tolerance. Um, mm-hmm. And I remember reading you know, so, so long ago, um, back when I was in college, um, uh, <laughs> about the two, two factors that are very good at indicators of whether a, a, an immigrant community has assimilated. Um, they are whether or not uh, they marry into native populations. Um, and whether they root for, um, the country they came from or their new country when, especially when they're facing off each other in sporting events. So for like Pakistani Mm -hmm. immigrants, it would be like, do you root root for, you know, Pakistan or America at the Olympics? Right. Um, uh, so those, that that was interesting, but it was interesting to me that marriage was a big part of it. But then of course it would be right. Like inter, it's a very, that's a most, um, you know, important, relationship that many of us, um, you know, willingly, um, sign on to is, 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 is marriage mm-hmm. is our spouse is our partner in life is somebody we create children with. Um, and to the extent that there are more interracial people, I, I think that that is, that is a wonderful sign. And that is true. It is true that a lot of people are moving beyond oh, the kind of on. racism that we saw in, um, in, in the Western world. Um, even, even, you know, not too long ago. And I think we're moving beyond it. We're not, we're not away from it entirely, but we are moving beyond it. Having said that, um, elite culture trickles down everywhere and it influences policy in a way that the uh, normal Americans cannot, um, they simply cannot. Uh, so we will be seeing, we will be, even if we don't feel the way that the elites feel about race, we will be behaving the way they behave in terms of race, um, we will be applying the same mechanisms of, you know, tokenism or what have you in our, uh, organizations, in our workspaces. Um, and that is something that, that we, we really can't help. Um, so actually I was looking, I was looking at the data, um, on, on race in America and, and it's interesting that the, the, the sort of macro index of, of how we measure, uh, racial progress, it's all in the right direction. Like you said, you know, there's increasing numbers of, of inter, interracial marriages. The other one is there's an, there's an annual survey asking people, would you live next door to somebody of a different race? And they ask this mm-hmm. across the world and they do a cross-cultural comparison. America has been moving um, again in the right direction and it's, it's, it's very consistent. But on the other hand, if you look at the public's views of the country's racial progress, it is the other way. It is negative and it, mm. it's, been, it's been declining. And so while you have this phenomenon where by action, it seems like 
America has gotten more and more and more tolerant. Um, the the views of of the public in the last I don't know five years it looks like um, that that's when the, their views of, of racial progress has really took, taken a, a dive and I think in part this is what you're referring to with um, you know if if sort of elite culture uh, has been um, deriding race relations and uh, kind of inflaming it for the last you know five years and, and using the racial lens as the sole way to adjudicate or analyze on all, almost any issue. You're starting to see that with like, you know, news media articles, right? Um, mm -hmm. When they insert like, you know, let's say there's a mass murder or something like when the race is, is relevant, <laughs> when it's not. And, and this game that is played in, in, in the media, um, of course, people look at that. Like everyday people are, are looking at this and saying like, no, wait a minute. Something about race relations isn't, isn't uh, you know, what it used to be. But, yeah. but on the other hand, they are becoming more and more tolerant. And you see this, especially generational, like the, the young generation, the, you know, what do you call it, Z now, they're the most uh, tolerant and, and not just of any race, but also of, uh, you know, sexual minorities. Right. It, it's um, something that I, I, I haven't quite, you know, uh, crystallized in my own thinking, but, but it feels like um, uh, a separation between the reality of race as most people experience it and the concept of race as it is in, in the cultural discourse. Um, and I think, you know, one of the more interesting things um, about the 2020 election was that more black and brown people voted for Trump in 2020 than they did in 2016, <laughs> um, which a lot of people didn't know about. And it is not discussed as often as it it really should be something that's discussed all the time. Why did it happen? I mean, it didn't happen in huge numbers, but it did happen. And so we should think about what's going on there, you know, because we, we did nothing but focus on, you know, race for four years. And, um, and some black and brown people responded to that by going towards the person who's supposed to be this uh, herald of, of white supremacy rule in, in America. So we should just think about what exactly is going on here and whether there are other factors at play and other things that people care about. And maybe there, maybe there's even an element of, of rebellion here um, that, that is something that should be looked into. So there's the reality of race. Um, there's also a lot of mm -hmm. Latinos who are moving away in Texas. That's a big Correct. issue. I follow Texas politics. So that's Correct. where I'm from. And there are a lot of Latinos who are walking away from the democratic party and walking towards um, the, the, the Republican party. And, and at a time where we're told that they are white supremacists. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> the way to square that circle in the eyes of some media elite is to call those people <laughs> Um, themselves yep. avatars of white supremacy. They are white adjacent yeah, or the black face, politically yeah. white. Yeah, they're it's it's to it's to it's to uh, take the little race out of the equation and instead um, discuss what is political differences as racial differences. So there's something very interesting going on here sociologically, yeah. um, and 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 maybe that's the distinction here. Maybe that's the way to think about what you were saying, Angel. That that there's the, the way people people really are. And then there's what appears to be happening in terms of race. Maybe those are just, yeah. it's really just two different phenomena that, it, that one has really nothing to do with the race, even though it seems like it has. Yeah. That's the flattening again, right? Because you're talking about, all right, let's say Latinos, right? What well, that encompasses so many different cultures and so many different perspectives, so many different people that are all lumped together and we're just trying to get the Latino vote. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think you mean the Latinx then, you know, vote. Uh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. No, I just cringed. I got douche chills. I, I just think that when the New York Times has to contort itself into a pretzel, pretzel just to have to run the headline to explain the phenomenon you just described, Sarah, as right. multiracial whiteness or multi-ethnic whiteness, I, I think that's right. when we we really lost the plot, right, as a society. Yeah, it's totally jumping the shark and it's totally missing out on something really important. Like the reason you're losing people is because they're clearly not relating to the narrative that you're pushing. They're going, that's not my reality at all. That's not what I think at all. That's not what I care about at all. Well, I'm not going to hang out with you now. I'm going to go hang out with them, which is, you know, that's also kind of a, a false sort of binary thing of like, well, I don't like you. So I'm just going to go hang out with, you know, your enemy. 
that yeah. because those are my only choices. That's well, also kind of silly, but I mean, but there's also uh, it's also a side effect of of true you know racial harmony and diversity that you know I mean I experience this as a minority. I don't mm. like hearing white people denigrated all the time. I, you know, I have a lot of close people in my life who are white. You know, I mean, right. we're talking about interracial marriage. There are people who are marrying white people and and thinking this person's not the devil. And this is my spouse. <laughs> this is somebody I love. And you know, and maybe my children, you know, look yeah. white or they're white adjacent or whatever it is, right? But it, it, you start to, as you start to truly you know, become one, you know, it's to really to see each other as, as human, it becomes more and more difficult to accept this narrative where one person is, uh, or, you know, one, one race is, is the, you know, the devil that we all have to face yeah. together. I think our mutual friend Faisal, he's, you know, one of my favorite tweets of all time is he's like, look, I'm not racist, but I don't hate white people. <laughs> you know and i, I yeah. forget i forget which it is i'm pretty sure it was a jazz musician i can't remember who said it now but it was something to the effect of you know they keep wanting me to hate white people but i keep meeting them yeah. and it completely makes it impossible yeah you know it's it's the reality on the ground is so different than the rhetoric and i feel like so much of that is why we're having such trouble mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I really want to talk to you about, uh, you wrote about Joe Rogan, you wrote about censorship in your sub stack. And I think that you, I think Melissa, Melissa agrees, you kind of, you just struck the perfect chord with respect to what the problem is, acknowledging what the problems are, but also looking at the proposed solutions of shutting it down and, you know, shouting it down and all that sort of stuff. And the, the, the backfire effect that you anticipate, which I think is totally true. Um, but why don't you, yeah, why don't you um, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, um, maybe a surprise to some, but I, you know, I like Joe Rogan. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm not a surprise to you guys, but it's, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, th- there's um, this, Part of it is was is just a general discussion that we've been having about finding villains in the narrative and pinning on them um, a lot of other uh, aspects of of, of the, the the discourse that is troubling to us. Um, so there's a desire, I think, to to pin on someone um, vaccine hesitancy, and you know, it seems sounds like forever ago now that that that. We even went through yeah, all right. this, right? I mean, because right, of the, yeah. the war in Ukraine and everything. But it, there was a time where this was really important, and <laughs> um, uh, and I, I think there was there's a desire to find an enemy because it cannot be us, right? It cannot be we, the media elite, uh, are doing everything right. Someone is, um, you know, uh, uh, messing with it, the minds of the Americans, is giving them propaganda. Um, and, and we need to target this person. And if it is the case that we can, we can successfully take away their platform, people will now behave as we want them to behave. Um, and I think that's a very, I mean, that, that in itself, it's probably a very simplistic, uh, uh, caricature maybe of, of what they think, but I, I think there's some truth to it. Um, mm-hmm. there's some truth to, to approaching Joe as, um, the one in that in that case, the one enemy that if we if we are able to take down, we are we will see um, less misinformation. We will see uh, people behaving in the way that we want them to. But I think that the, the thing that um, I pointed out in my my piece that I thought was really missing from a lot of the here's why Joe Rogan is good actually articles um, was that Joe is trusted. And trusted not in the way that we would trust necessarily a doctor, right? There's two elements of trust. There's trust in their competency and capacity as, you know, thinkers, as experts, you know, trust in, in, in that, that I might have of, of in a brilliant scientist to know what it is that he's talking about or, you know, for trust in my doctor to know what she's talking about. Um, but there's the other element of trust, of trust and intentions. Um, and I think that that is where Joe Rogan captures something that that people don't feel anymore for the rest of the, the the media. They don't feel that they can trust 
the CNN to have their best interests at, at heart. They don't feel like they can trust Fox News to have their best interests at, at heart. Um, they feel like they are being force fed a narrative because they are. Um, they feel as if um, they're being commanded to behave in a certain way rather than talk to like thinking and rational individuals. Um, and their response to that is to, to tune into this guy who is, um, seems very empathetic. He seems curious and open-minded and, um, is just wanting to understand the world a little bit more. Um, and he's open about when he doesn't understand things. He's open about when he's been wrong before. He jokingly calls himself, you know, a dummy all the time. And all of that, you know, gets you to think, I think in, in the minds of a lot of people, and even in me, that this is a guy I can, I can trust his intentions, even if I don't trust that the information he's giving me exa is exactly the way it is. I can trust that he's not trying to lie to me in order to, you know, force feed me one narrative or another. And that's the element of trust that I think the media, that's where the media is losing. Um, mm -hmm. It's trust in intentions, uh, not trust in credentials, you know? So you can't just be like, doctors say 20,000 doctors hate Joe right. Rogan, you know? That's not gonna change anything because it's not about, they're not doubting the doctor's know-how, they're doubting the doctor's intentions um and they don't oh, they're doubt probably doubting jokes. both they're probably they're doubting probably, both. yeah sure maybe they're I mean, doubting both but i think and but you know it does get complicated because you know joe rogan has doctors on his show and then they have right, a counter right. narrative to the narrative and so well now we have competing doctors so now it's about kind of Correct. exposing one or the other as a quack and um it, it just becomes really difficult i think and you know joe is just a guy i mean i don't you know i've been saying i don't know how many times he has to say, I'm an idiot, don't listen to me, before people recognize, you know, maybe they shouldn't listen to him. And there's also a thing of the, you know, people who who criticize the fact that he's having a conversation with somebody who is spewing misinformation, which a hundred percent has happened. Yeah. Right. Um, but they can they can watch the show and they can watch the episode in order to criticize it and pull quotes and talk about how terrible it was. They can watch it and listen to it without being swayed by this, you know, venom of, of misinformation yeah. to mix metaphors. Yeah. Um, but, but the fear is no, 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 but they can't, they don't have this capacity. Mm -hmm. Other people don't have this capacity to mm -hmm. just watch that show and decide for themselves what they think. You mm -hmm. know, the minute they put on Joe Rogan, they're just brainwashed. And that yeah. seems to be the implication when, when, yeah. you know, nobody ever quite gets there. But my Definitely. question, I mean, of, I mean, there's a, know? there's a, you're dumb and you need, you need to have us explain to you how to think about right. things, um, right. which is the opposite approach than the one Joe takes. And the one Joe takes is obviously very appealing to people um, mm. in a fundamental sense. And it makes, makes sense why it is. Um, right. And, you know, I think that this trust in media problem that's been getting pretty bad is just going to get worse because I don't see... Yep. Uh, a lot of them, there was a brief period, if you remember, after the election mm. of Donald Trump, where for like two weeks, there was introspection. There was like, how did this happen? Like, two, uh, just, just tiny yeah. sliver like of time. I remember New York Times being like, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. How did this happen? Um, and, and that was it. And then it, yeah. and then it just disappeared. You know, like um yeah. and 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 then there was this fever of of you know that, that took over a lot of people um right. during the trump um trump era and we haven't been back to that oh no i think i think you know obviously the that there there's a very obvious double standard here right because joe is 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 constantly accused of uh putting out disinformation or, or misinformation on, on his podcast just by interviewing the wrong person or or just you know getting um or, or just like saying something about say the the vaccines um that that may not you know be completely aligned with what the cdc is saying and and but on the other hand, that happens a lot in the news media and they get caught out a lot, but there's never any mea culpa, mm -hmm. um, even with fact-checking sites. But but it's so rare to, to see cable news or, or you know, one of the big legacy media institutions just put out something and say, you know what, we got this story wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, recently, yes, I, I did see the, the New York Times come out and actually say, uh, you know, we actually did verify the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop. 
you know, sorry, yeah. Yeah. without saying sorry, but but yeah. the, that kind of thing needs to happen <laughs> more and more often because because unless they acknowledge, because you know that's the thing, Joe Joe does that. Like he at least is 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 seen as somebody who, um, as you said, his intentions are are just getting to the truth. He's not going to say the truth all the time because none of us know it right. beforehand a priori. But but at least that's his directionality. Mm-hmm. And, and people yeah. just don't trust that the news media is there. And until I think there are more mea culpas and, and just straight talk whenever they get something yeah. wrong. Um, and we, to be we're fair, Joe, get there. Joe is totally, you know, just like everybody else, he's totally biased. He's totally, sure. you know, he's going to be interested in certain things. You know, he has a tendency towards conspiracy. He mm-hmm. loves that stuff. You know, that's mm-hmm. just kind of um, but aliens, but yeah. again, yeah, you know, aliens, Sasquatch, etc. Uh, I've, I've listened to many, many hours of Joe Rogan being ridiculous, <laughs> but that's not the point. It's kind of what Sarah was saying. You know, what you were saying, Sarah is, is, is that he, he at least comes off to people as a genuine, just dude that you can trust to at least be himself, mm-hmm. whether, whether that himself is, you know, super flawed and says terrible, ridiculous things. That's not really as important as the fact that I, I, kn- I feel like I know you and mm-hmm. I trust you. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that the, the, you know, the majority of what I've seen uh, in terms of media response was more of a, how dare you not believe us over him? Mm-hmm. And I saw one tweet by one person. I wish I could pull it up. There was one person who said, what we, what we really need to think about something to the effect of this was, what really we what we really need to think about is why people are more willing to believe him over us. I think I know exact. I remember that exact tweet. Um, yeah, it was it's by, like one. Yeah, it was just one, <laughs> and then the response to that by I think there was Nicole Hannah Jones' response to it. Um, who she was and her response was simply, um, "Well, we know why. You know something about racism." <laughs> <laughs> and like she has she has that one hammer, right? And um, right. I, so there's a. Uh, I think that uh, what you said, Melissa, is, is so important that they have been wrong. Um, there is misinformation also coming from the news media. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes, I mean, it doesn't have to be deliberate, right? And it doesn't have to be, we're all doing our best. We're all trying to figure out what, you know, what's going on. And sometimes we are wrong. And that's, that, that happens. And it's, it, it may be we, that we did everything right, but we are wrong anyway, because the information given to us was flawed. That, that, that there was some other information that we didn't know, that we didn't take into account. Um, and there's nothing, uh, I mean, there's, I think there's a sense with the news media that if we admit to how wrong we are, how as often as we are, uh, that we will lose trust, which they interpret as merely authority, you know, trust as us, as authority figures which is the kind of trust they're willing, they're, they're really nervous to lose. And because they're so nervous to lose that kind of trust, they, in fact, uh, uh, harm um, very much that, that other layer of trust um, uh, that people have over, over the intention. So I think, um, I, I think that was interesting because Joe Rogan really is um, sort of an open-minded guy. <laughs> open-minded is an interesting word, but a really open-minded. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of weird stuff on mm. his show. Um, but it is that, it is that responsibility thing that we talked about earlier about, you know, this is kind of what we need to do when we have, you know, everyone can have a podcast and everyone has a platform and everyone can speak. You and, need to kind of take it upon yourself to, you know, be an adult and go, okay, I need to discern for myself. What's yeah. going on here? Yeah. But you there's know, a lack of trust. To, Are yeah. normal people smart enough to, to be able to filter through? I and mean, that's what they, that's what the, right. they sincerely believe that a normal person can't parse through data and information, but we can. And that's why we, right. you know, put out the Vox explainers and we explain to you what you need to know about this complicated right. issue. But they're, and they're missing, they're missing the fact that it's not the information. It's kind of actually what you mentioned in the beginning. Like, oh, if I just explain to them, what the reality is, then everything will be fine and they'll be on my side. And it's clearly yeah. more complicated than that. Yeah. You know, it brings us back to that, I think. But, you know, the important thing I think to note is that it does matter to have institutions. We need these things mm-hmm. and we need these kind of places that we can trust to be honest and forthright. Mm-hmm. And if we lose them, we're really fucked because look, I mean, look at the mayhem that we're in. 
Yeah. You, you, yeah. You're seeing that, you, you're seeing exactly that play out right now with the Russia, Ukraine, because I, I'm seeing a lot of arguments like, remember that time when the news media all lied to us about WMDs and going into Iraq? How can you mm. trust when they're all unanimous now and reporting on one side, you know, and it seems, so now they're, they're using previous, previous missteps of the news media and, 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 you know, no, pretty much, I mean, where, where's the Mia Kappa? A lot of people just in the news media today ignore that. Um, and, and, and using that as, as a way to kind of frame the, the current actions of, of the, the media. And, and Angel, you're right. We need these institutions because we can't make sense of the world. You know, they have resources, uh, foreign bureaus. They can send reporters on the ground in the ways that, you know, frankly, Substack journalists just can't because it doesn't scale that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do need that information. But, but now we have past, you know, mistakes kind of coloring our view of a current for current mm-hmm. event that that's very you know that's very significant is going on now and nobody knows what to trust and I see now the new right kind of you know rising up and 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 almost parroting what the old hippie left um, right. is 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 saying and and it, it's a very <laughs> weird world now. Yeah, there's definitely yeah. a horseshoe thing going on. I see a lot of the far far left like total lunatics anti NATO people and the the far right coming together in a really spectacular yep. m- manner and um yep. yeah, I, I know why it's happening i and i know that it'll continue to happen um until some of the grown-ups really decide that that major changes need to take place um and i you know in, in terms of if we, if we can just focus on one elite media institution and i don't think that some people say that you know it's wrong to just focus on the drama going on in the new york times um or at harvard or or, or yale um because they don't represent anything else and I, I disagree i really think elite culture permeates everything else because these are the people who end up being our leaders um and these are the people who are the most influential thinkers in in our world whether we like it or not so whatever they think um uh, spills over into everything else uh, eventually, and I, I, I it, it, it's really disheartening to me to see, to see that there there just aren't enough people in these institutions that are standing up and saying that look, this doesn't make any sense, and and we need to we need to turn this train around uh, right now, or it will be too mm-hmm. late. And I wonder if it already is too late. Um, like I wonder if it is. Uh, you, I, I, I'm not a part of the New York Times, so I don't know the internal dynamics mm-hmm. that are that are taking place there. But if it's anything like the organizations that I'm familiar with in my own little tiny um, uh, you know, speck of the universe, um, uh, it feels as if it's too late, um, mm-hmm. that, yeah. that too many people who care have left um, or have been beaten down, um, too concerned about their own um, careers about their financial stability and that you have every right to be, that's a very normal, um, mm. thing to be, to be concerned about, but together it's, it's this collective cowardice, um, mm. that is going to ensure that we, we just continue on this really frightening, frightening little path. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so depressing. I, I feel like yeah. I show up on, on there's on that podcast. world weary <laughs> activist. Yeah. There's that world weary <laughs> activist again, but actually I wonder what you think, because, uh, in the last few days, um, the New York Times in particular has put out some interesting stuff where a lot of people are saying maybe maybe this is turning a corner. Uh, there was an, you know, the editorial board released this piece on free speech and the free speech mm. culture, mm-hmm. which I think was pretty good. Uh, there was a couple mm. of silly missteps, but overall, I think pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. There was a, an op-ed by Emma Camp where at least, the, you know, they're talking about the mm-hmm. culture of kind of the chilling effect of mm-hmm. censoriousness. Um, mm-hmm. And just today, I read a piece about someone making the case for saying, you know, you can learn, I think it's, you can learn good things from bad people, something mm-hmm. to that effect, you know, just like you can appreciate yep. one particular piece of somebody's humanity, even mm-hmm. if they turn out to be terrible about something else. Mm-hmm. And that's all coming from the New York Times. So do you think something's going on there? Is there, is there a glimmer of hope for you? Can we put a little bit of hope and fire <laughs> back into your chest? <laughs> Um, you know, no, um, <laughs> it, <it's>, really? <laughs> well, it's, it's very nice to see that some people are becoming more aware of, of the problem and there's even more space to talk about that problem. 
I mean, the New York Times op-ed that you're talking about with Emma Camp, uh, it, it's it's one of those things that it's evidence of maybe the New York Times addressing this issue, but there was also a huge backlash to it. That reminds me of the Harper's yeah. letter. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's true. And <laughs> it's almost it's almost proof of how bad things are actually. Damn that it, a Sarah. Very, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> that a very um, you know just. It, it didn't seem to me to be a piece that is, you know, throwing a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, f- cannons left and right, or throwing cannons at them. But it, you, you see what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But it, it it didn't seem to me to be the kind of piece that that warranted that kind of reaction. Just like the Harper Center was this very very yeah. mildly worded, anodyne. yeah, very yeah, anodyne. Super. And I remember. You know, even even as I was I was reading it and it, it, like the, the the draft of it, and I remember thinking, is this this is going to have n- no one's going to pay any attention to this? Like, okay, fine, I'll put my you know I'll put my name on, and then and then nothing will happen. I was so shocked to see yeah. that it was like an earthquake, and and everybody was behaving as if uh, something in there was this incredible stance that people were taking, and I I I was. That was also one of those moments where you stop and think, oh, things are maybe worse than <laughs> than, than I anticipated, <laughs> um, because there's no reason it should have warranted that kind of reaction. Um, and, in, and, and in fact, that it did. I, I, OK, I'll try my hand in offering you a glimmer of hope before Angel um, asks you the, the last question. Um, <laughs> what do you think about, you know, kind of the the, the geopolitical trends right now? Because. Maybe like five years ago, um, everyone thought that, or a, a lot of people thought that the um, biggest problem that was, you know, plaguing the West was Islamic radicalization. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, the world was filling up with liberal democracies and, and, and you know, all of a sudden it seems today um, the, the rise of these, you know, authoritarian sort of all power politics has really come to play again. Meanwhile, look at the Middle East. Um, it, you know, especially post Abraham Accords, uh, they're signing deals. Ambassadors are meeting. Um, I think uh, the first Israeli uh, Jewish uh, baby was born in the UAE in, in the last few months. <laughs> um, there just things seem to be going in a very different direction than uh, what was imagined among um, kind of you know certain think tanks and and uh, political mm-hmm. commentators just 5 years ago is mm-hmm. do you see any hope of that i mean even in as how say the kingdom has uh, saudi arabia looks to be liberalizing you know mm-hmm. on that on that path even under mbs um any glimmer of hope there yeah that's, so that's i think that's an interesting um point um Melissa, and i i i, I, I it is nice to see um Western elites um, forcibly say that that authoritarianism is not something that we are willing to tolerate, and to recognize Russia as as an authoritarian um, uh, uh, state, even though there were there, there's a lot of elements that that you know, especially the 2020 election, the 2016 election, that go into how we're casting um, uh, the the war today. Uh, but that I I think there's something interesting there, and. I can't say I'll allow myself hope, um, but <laughs> I will wait and see um, if it is the case that, um, you know, an, an empowered an increasingly empowered China, um, these threats from the, from from Russia to from various authoritarian countries, if they if they allow um, the West to have an understanding of itself uh, to, to to to, I guess, rediscover what it is that mm. makes the West such a uniquely interesting place, um, such a, a, the place that, that birthed a lot of the civil liberties and human rights that we cherish so much today. Um, if we can rediscover that a little bit and, um, you know, unfortunately it shouldn't take the threat of, you know, authoritarian, an authoritarian <laughs> gun, <laughs> not, uh, uh, but, but if it does and, and it helps us rediscover that, then I think that that is, um, definitely that is, uh, a hopeful sign. So I'll give you that, Melissa. That okay. was that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take we'll take one glimmer of hope from you to look forward to in the world. Maybe, maybe. Well, Sarah, you are you're reminding me a lot of Morgan Freeman's character in the movie Seven, oh. which is you know you're like you're like ready to go. You're just like oh my god, the world is awful. But 
but you're still getting up and you're still doing things. And, you know, that I think the movie ends on this quote, this voiceover of Morgan Freeman in his beautiful voice saying, you know, Ernest Hemingway once said that the world is good and worth saving. Mm-hmm. And, he, and then the character says, I agree with the second part. So maybe we can at least get you to agree with the second part. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, you know, I think um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a believer in humanity uh, and I, or if, if, if maybe belief is a weird, weird word there, but, but mm. it is something that I, I, I want us to prosper. I want us to, uh, you know, have a future um, and not just like from the, 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 personal sense that of course you know and at any time you 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 have family members in the world you you tend to care about uh the world itself um as sure. as your backyard but be, beyond that i i i do think that there's a way out of it i mm. wonder if we're just in um some dark times and uh and i i my, it, it's not to say that this is where we will be forever but it certainly feels as if um, it, the path towards making things better is not, is not very clear. Um, yeah. and I think in the way that I think, um, I think a lot in terms of incentives, um, and as much as I would love for people to just stand up and be brave and risk it all, you know, right. I, um, it, in reality, incentives matter a lot. And if we are, um, living in a, in, in a society where, uh, to 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 behave in a way that 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 harms you know so many of these values that we care about and 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 in the end uh, in a, in, a, in a way that ends up destroying the foundations of institutions that we value if that's if the incentives are lined up in that way that is how you know reliably many people are going to behave so the way that what i've been thinking about now and i don't have an answer for you um, at the moment but the the way that i've been thinking about it now is what can we do to change this this environment change reorder these mm. incentives in a way that will uh allow people um the freedom that they need or the, the courage that they need to start to start speaking up mm. well it's almost like you know what i'm about to ask you next the, the our, our <laughs> final question that we ask every guest I, maybe it'll give you a chance to kind of muse on on exactly that um but our focus at fair is to provide a pro-human approach to all the issues we've been talking about, all these important things Mm -hmm. that are difficult and nuanced. Um, And so the question for for you is, what does pro-human mean to you? How do you conceptualize that idea? Mm -hmm. And how would you advise people on how they can be pro-human in their day-to-day lives? Um, You know, I, I... I wish I could give an extremely profound answer. I probably won't. Um, but, <laughs> uh, you know, to me, it means um, having a sense of, of duty towards others. Um, or that's how I see myself as being pro-human. That maybe this is the activist in me that I, you know, I, w- I wake up every day and I think, um, you know, what can I do um, to make the world a better place to make, you know, and if it was the case that I was just, you know, would wake up and think, let me just live for me. Then I think I would make a lot of different choices in terms of in my occupation and in my, you know, my day-to-day, um, day-to-day, day-to-day choices. But I wish we would understand again, or, or re to, to, to acknowledge again, the importance of, of duty towards others. And we, I think we understood it in a, military sense, you know, like a martial sense, um, that, that that's who we think of when we think of, you know, duty to your country, like in a patriot, uh, uh, pa- patriotic way. And I think there's an element of that, but I think there's this also a, a general sense of duty towards your neighbor, um, du- duty towards your family. Um, and I think that if we start orienting ourselves a little bit more onto others, um, that, that, that will that will be that's the first step towards being um pro human you know it's not just pro me it's pro others pro you pro um you know like pro my neighbor um and i think that that's that's something that we are losing maybe it's because of modernity maybe it's because of the way that you know we have various factors um that that force us to 
to think in terms of me and be very, you know, uh, trapped in our own heads and thinking about ourselves and our choices and what we want and um, our mental states. Um, and I wish we would we would leave that space for just a little bit and and start thinking about others. I think that's beautifully profound. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Hader, thank you so much for joining us on Fair Perspectives. Thank you for having me. This was a lovely conversation. I'm, I'm really glad to, to have been able to speak to you guys my first time speaking to both of you. And it's just, um, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Fair Perspectives. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it by subscribing on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a positive rating and review. You can also access exclusive podcast content, such as Q&As and bonus episodes, by visiting us and signing up at fairperspectives.org. For weekly fair news and opinion pieces by members of the fair community, visit our Substack at fairforall.substack.com and tune into Fair News Weekly wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to join or support the pro-human movement, visit us at fairforall.org slash join us. Thanks again and see you next time.